once upon a time there was a magical land that had yet to be called America. In 1491, the year before Christopher Columbus sailed to an island in the Americas, the continent of North America was a very different place than what we know of today. The Native Americans that called this land home lived in harmony with the environment, respecting the land, water, and sky. After all, according to most Native American cultures, each had a spirit that was due the utmost respect. A different place. Trees were thousands of years old, some more than 30 feet around. The canopy of trees was so thick, it was said that a squirrel could travel from the East Coast to the Mississippi River without touching the ground. An ocean of 50 billion trees covered what we now call the United States. As flocks of birds were so thick and plentiful, it is said that a passing flock would completely block out the sun. Rivers and streams so abundant with fish that a basket could simply be lowered into the water and when pulled back up, it would be filled to the rim with fresh fish. The American bison that covered the Great Plains in numbers as high as 60, possibly 70 million strong. By 1884, after the arrival of Europeans and the birth of the United States, that number was as low as 325. But that's a story for another unit. North America was home to more people than Europe in 1491, and it was not just a vast wilderness with small pockets of tribes scattered throughout. We've learned about the complex cultures and civilizations of the Maya, Aztecs, and the Inca, but the Americas were home to over 500 nations of people, all with distinct cultures, beliefs, and accomplishments worthy of great respect. We will take a look at five of these nations. Bonjour, ça va bien? Comment allez-vous? Uh oh, am I speaking French? There I go again. Sorry, I guess I was in a French mood because the Native American group I'm going to tell you about has a French name. The Iroquois, or Iroquois. But of course, they weren't French and didn't speak French. The Iroquois called themselves Haudenosaunee, which means people of the longhouse. When neighboring enemies of the Haudenosaunee were asked by French explorers for their name, they replied, oh, who, those people living in longhouses? We call them Iroquois, which means rattlesnakes. The French added their own French twist and it became Iroquois, or Iroquois. For some reason, the name has stuck for centuries. Although no one is going to call themselves a rude name like rattlesnakes, the Iroquois lived in the eastern woodlands, around what is now upstate New York, near Canada. The Iroquois live closest to where you and I live today. Where you and I live. I for Iroquois. The eastern woodlands. I mean, if you looked out your window about 500 years ago, you would be staring into deep woods. You may have guessed that the people of the Longhouse lived in, well, longhouses. Longhouses were made of birch wood with birch bark siding and could be up to 300 or more feet long. Each longhouse housed several generations of a family. Your parents, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandma, even your slap-happy grandpappy. They would all share a longhouse. Oh yeah, extended family too, you know, like that fake cousin of yours. In all, up to 60 people would share the comfort and safety of a single longhouse. For food, the Iroquois did it all. They hunted, fished, trapped, gathered, and farmed. You probably are already familiar with those three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. They were considered special gifts 
from the Creator. The Iroquois were expert farmers and didn't just throw seeds into the ground and hope for the best. There was a strategy. First, the corn stalks grow. Then, bean plants climb the corn stalks. And finally, squash was planted beneath, stopping weeds and keeping the soil moist under the broad, shady leaves. But life for the Iroquois wasn't all work. They allowed time for fun and games, too. Well, sort of. A game called Little Brother of War. You may know it by its French name, Lacrosse. So this so-called game was a cultural event that could involve 30 players, but was known to involve up to 10,000 participants as towns would take on towns in games that continued for days. Players would gamble items from crops to children and wives. Now, that's a high-stakes game. In the 1700s, a maneuver called skull crushing was finally banned from the game. Sheesh. I would definitely need a helmet before stepping on that field. Yes, people died in these lacrosse games. But often disputes were settled in this way, making it a less violent alternative to war. I gotta say, if lacrosse was war's little brother, I'd hate to see Big Brother War. We can't leave the Iroquois without acknowledging that the Iroquois formed a confederacy. In other words, they were organized into states. There were five, the Onondaga, Oneida, Cayuga, Seneca, and Mohawk. Each could rule itself, but they could come together as one nation if a situation was big enough to require all, like poor crop seasons and war. Their government was a system that included a commander-in-chief and a council that voted on laws. Sound familiar? Later, when the United States of America was forming its first government, Ben Franklin studied the Iroquois Confederacy and their form of government and borrowed heavily from it to create the government that we use to this day. The rugged Pacific coastal range swirling ocean waves, almost constant driving rains. This was the home to the Quakutl, described by some as the show-offs of the Americas. Quakutl art is some of the most eye-catching around. Towering totem poles announced information about family clans for all to see. Quakutl art even made its way into the National Football League. Does this look familiar? I know, not as many Super Bowls as like the Dallas Cowboys, but interesting nonetheless. The Quakutl made full use of the giant cedar trees of the Northwest region. They used the cedar lumber for beautiful plank houses, and the bark of the cedar trees were used for everything from clothing to baskets, from thread to headbands, Cutting down the monster cedar trees was made a bit easier because the Quakutl had a type of tool that few others in North America had, metal tools. They got access to these metal axes by trading with their Inuit neighbors to the north. Living on the Pacific Ocean, the Quakutl fished on a grand scale. As a matter of fact, they not only fished, but they also whaled and walrused, um, hunted walrus, sorry. Let's go back to the whaling or hunting of whales. To hunt a creature this large, you'd better use a super-sized canoe. And that the Quakutl had. Some of their canoes could accommodate up to 50 hunters. Even with so many skilled hunters on the job, whaling was and still is a dangerous business. But just like about all Native American cultures, they were sure 
that no part of any animal killed was wasted. First, a prayer of thanks, and then an offering to the animal spirit. The Pueblo. W wait a minute. Pueblo is a Spanish word, right? It means village in Espanol. So I bet you're wondering what the people of the Southwest called themselves. Well, some people will tell you Anasazi, but that is a Navajo word for ancient enemy. So that's not it either. The Spanish called any people of the Southwest Pueblo people or village people because the Spanish explorers thought their settlements resembled villages. But two of the most famous groups of the Pueblo people actually called themselves the Hopi and the Zuni. Living in the searing heat of the Southwest Desert wasn't easy, but the Pueblo irrigated rivers. You know, they brought water from a place that had water to a place that did not. By irrigating, the Pueblo grew two very important crops, cotton for clothing and corn for food. Correct. The American Southwest Pueblo people introduced the world to corn tortillas. Mmm, the old soft taco. Yum. The Pueblo lived in apartment-style homes that could be entered using a ladder. These homes were made from a special brick called adobe, a sun-baked mix of mud and straw. The Spanish explorers called the Pueblo homes Pueblos. Right, so the Pueblos lived in Pueblos. I, I wish that was a joke. <clears throat> Sometimes the Pueblo built their homes right in the sides of cliffs. Archaeologists are not sure why they did this. Was it religious? Was it defense? Either way, I hope there were no sleepwalkers among the Pueblo. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I think it's time to cool off. No better place to cool off than in Alaska and Northern Canada and Greenland too. This was and is the homeland of the Inuit. This group used to be commonly referred to as Eskimo because when European explorers asked the Algonquin Native Americans what group lived in the frozen north, they replied Eskimo, which means eaters of raw meat. I know sushi eaters, how offensive is that? However, if you ask the Inuit themselves, they would have replied, we are Inuit, which means people. Hey, nothing wrong with keeping it simple. Don't get it twisted. The Inuit were far from simple people. They carved out a living and not only survived, but thrived in some of the world's most harsh conditions. The below freezing conditions of the Arctic. The Inuit were master whalers. The hunting whales using an invention called a harpoon in order to tow the whale to shore while paddling in another Inuit invention, the kayak. Pretty chill, huh? Get it? Chill? <clears throat> okay, I, I won't do that again. Now look, the Inuit weren't cold-blooded. They used every part of that huge whale. Uh, cold-blooded, there I go again. Uh, just take a look at this igloo here. See the whale bones? Oh, you didn't know igloos looked like this? Well, how about this? Well, igloo in the Inuit language just means house, not ice house. So summer igloos look like this. And in winter, you get the point. The Inuit had metal tools and that was a rarity among North American native people. They traded with Asians for metal tools, which made them intercontinental traders. The Inuit spent a lot of time hunting whales and walruses and narwhal in the freezing waters of the Arctic Ocean. If they were to get wet, 
death would follow in minutes. To stay dry, the Inuit wore parka-style jackets made of... Anyone? Anyone? Good. Made from seal intestines. Hey, intestines are definitely waterproof. And you can thank polar bears for the Inuit's brilliant seal hunting tactics. In the ice, seals must create breathing holes. Polar bears simply needed to find a breathing hole and wait for the seal to come and sneak a breath. Its last breath. Inuit seal hunters copied this technique using a seal club to finish the deal. They call Alaska the land of the midnight sun because in the Arctic there are about six months of darkness and six months of daylight. Now, with all that constant sunlight reflecting off that white snowy surface, the Inuit needed one more thing to deal with the very real threat of snow blindness. That's right, the Inuit invented sunglasses. I told you they were cool. Now we're off to the home where the buffalo roam. Well, it's actually bison, where the bison roam. The Great Plains were home to many Native American nations. We will take a look at the Lakota. After all, two of our states are named for the Lakota. The Lakota were nomadic hunters who relied heavily on the bison for much of their survival needs. Before the arrival of European horses, the Lakota hunted the bison on foot. Now, that's dangerous. Hunting an animal that can run over 40 miles per hour is over 2,000 pounds, stands six feet at the shoulder, and can jump a six-foot fence. Put all that with an extremely low intelligence, and voila, danger. Yet, the Lakota hunted and honored the bison for thousands of years using every single part. These nomadic hunters moved with these immense herds. We're talking up to 70 million bison used to call the Plains of America home. Native Americans said it took three days and three nights for a single herd to pass by. To keep up with the migrating bison, the Lakota stayed on the move. As nomads, the Lakota lived in teepees made primarily from bison hides or skin. Teepees could be set up or broken down in an hour's time. This job was usually performed by Lakota women, as was the gathering of most prairie foods, the tanning of leather, sewing of deerskin clothing, food preparation, the raising of children, and on and on and on. Yeah, that's a lot. The Lakota were great warriors too, experts with a bow and arrow in their hands. However, they saw battle a little differently than we might expect. The Lakota culture thought it was cowardly to stand back and shoot at an enemy from afar with a bow and arrow or gun. For the Lakota, bravery was running directly into the teeth of the enemy army past whizzing arrows and whistling bullets, carrying a special stick called a coup stick. When you penetrated the enemy lines, you ran up to the leader, cracked him in the head as hard as you could with that coup stick, and ran off screaming victory. Now that's bravery. Lakota warriors counted their coup and watched their legend grow. Young men had hopes of becoming brave warriors like Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Spotted Tail, and Touch the Clouds. This is just a tiny glimpse of just five of the some 500 nations that covered North America. Each culture of Native Americans was different, but each was glued together by an understanding that we are connected to this natural earth. 
by taking care of our Earth, our Earth will take care of us. Isn't it time that we all understand and act?